Marshall Goldman. We'll probably still have some people coming in as the parking meters have just changed over. So, yes. so it's a lot to take seats. Um, before introducing our speaker this evening, I would like to bring your attention to a couple of upcoming events. On November 3rd, we will host Ambassador Ron Newman, who is a former ambassador to Afghanistan, who has just uh, completed the book, published the book, The Other War, Winning and Losing in Afghanistan. That event will take place at the University of California at Washington uh, Center on Rhode Island Avenue. And then on uh, November 9th, we will have an embassy series event. The ambassador of Egypt, uh, Sammy Shufri, will host his at his embassy. And then on November 16th, we have a very special event. It will be uh, the first of a series of events that we will be hosting in Northern Virginia. This one will be a luncheon event uh, on November 16th with General Michael Hayden, the former director of the Central Intelligence Agency, delivering a keynote address on cybersecurity, the international challenges of cybersecurity. And he will then be joined in a discussion uh, by Dr. James Lewis from CSIS and Dr. Jamie Saunders from the British Agency. I think that we have, uh, there are uh, flyers for all of these events out there at the, at the registration desk. Marshall Goldman is an expert on the economy of the former Soviet Union, a professor of economics at Wellesley College, and associate director of the Harvard Russian Research Center. Professor Goldman is a graduate of the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and received his MA and PhD degrees in Russian Studies and Economics from Harvard University. An internationally recognized authority on Russian economics, politics, and environmental policy, Professor Goldman is known for his study and analysis on the careers of Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin. He is the author of over a dozen books on the former Soviet Union, including USSR in Crisis, The Failure of an Economic System, Lost Opportunity, What Has Made Economic Reform in Russia So Difficult, and the one who's here to discuss with us tonight, Petra State. A consulting editor to the current to the journal Current History, Dr. Goldman offered, is often sought by the media. He has written frequently for such publications as Current History, Foreign Affairs, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Harvard Business Review, and his articles have appeared in the New Yorker, the Atlantic Monthly. Science. He's a frequent guest on CNN and Good Morning America and the Neil Blair News Hour, Crossfire, and many other of the, of the television programs we all watch. He has written regularly for the Russian newspapers, Moscow News, and Moscow Times. He's often heard on the NPR. Tonight he is here to talk with us about this new book, Petro State. And having read his extensive CV, I must say I was intrigued by the reference to the Wellesley Conservation Commission Incinerator Study Committee. And I hope that perhaps you'll have time to report the committee's findings to us uh, this evening. Dr. Goldman.
since they pay our way up and have to be brainwashed. But they take us, they've taken us actually now twice to the headquarters of Gospel. And it's it's quite a mystical experience because I don't know if any of you have been to Moscow, but it's in the southwest uh, portion of the city. Uh, and uh, it, it's a tall, high-rise building. So anyway, uh, it's out in the southwest portion of the city, and it stands up, and it's a pretty impressive building. There's nothing else quite, quite around it. Uh, and uh, so they take us in, and I'll describe it. First, I was puzzled. Where, where were they taking us? For such a big, sleek, glass, Moscow, high-rise, Gazprom's elevator, and its headquarters building was tiny. Here's this big building, and only five people could barely squeeze in, and its all corridors narrow. This was, after all, a real five students of natural gas, not to mention Russian guards and company. Following a short walk, we were ushered into a dark and silent room where nothing seemed to be happening. If you're paranoid like me, then I'll write down strange. <laughs> yeah, it was only when all the members of our group had made way, their way up on the elevator that the room suddenly came alive. Then, for a time, I I felt as if I'd wandered into the NASA Space Center, or was it a James Bond movie set? All that was missing was that out-of-body voice intoning, Welcome, Mr. Goldman. We were expecting you, if you've ever seen James Bond. <laughs> okay, anyway, in front of me, I'm sitting here in, 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 on the wall. In front of me, covering the whole one of the wall room, was a map with a spider-like wing spider web like maze of natural gas pipelines reaching from East Siberia west of the Atlantic Ocean and from the Arctic Ocean south of the Caspian and Black Seas. Manipulating this display were Gazprom dispatches, three men controlling the flow of Gazprom's gas to East and West European consumers of this Russian natural gas monopoly. No wonder there was such tight security. There was also a sense of self assurance. As measured by the value of its capital stock, corporate stock, by the summer of 2006, Gazprom, the state-dominated joint stock corporation until 1992 was actually the Soviet Ministry of the Gas Industry, uh, had become the world's third largest corporation. Only private shareholder owned Exxon Mobil and General Electric were larger. And some of you may have discovered to your dismay that uh, there was a Gazprom stock, the General Electric stock fell in value of Gazprom actually became the world's second largest stock by its corporate, uh, by its capital value. I've done one more sentence and I'm through. With the work of the switch, those dispatches sitting in this Moscow room could freeze and indeed have frozen entire countries. At the very least, they could send their citizens off in a panic in search of sweaters, scarves, and blankets. And it's the only book I've ever written with pictures. It's illustrated. Uh, it's a picture of that, of that room uh, with the dispatches and that map with the pipelines flowing, blinking as the moving gas uh, from east and west. Now, I, I, I read that because it, it's, it's very dramatic. I mean, you have to be uh, taken by it. And what is significant is that uh, we tend to forget now, but as on uh, August uh, 17, 1998, Russia was a, the country was effectively bankrupt. Uh, some of you may have had stock because it affected in this, in this country, and our stock market went down. It brought about the end of long-term capital management, which, which was a hedge fund. Again, we thought our whole economy was in danger of collapsing in 1998, and Gazprom was affected by this. Uh, effectively, it was it, the country and, and Gazprom were, were, were almost bankrupt. Uh, Ten years later, that was 1998, Ten years later, in uh, August 2008, just, just last year, uh, Russia had reserves of almost $600 billion. That's a pretty good rate of return from almost zero in 1998 to almost $600 billion in 2008. It had, as I say, the third largest reserves in the world, only after China uh, and Japan. And so what explains this? this transformation, and it really is a transformation, this, this rise from near bankruptcy or effective bankruptcy to, to a really a very buoyant, very strong uh, position. Well, uh, what happens is that in August, a year later, 1999, after the, after the year, uh, 1998 collapse, uh, Vladimir Putin is appointed as prime minister. 
And in January uh, uh, 19, uh, 2000, he becomes the president. So Putin comes in, and the, the currency comes flooding in. The country turns around and becomes very strong again. The discussion about bankruptcy is long. It's just a historical memory. Uh, and so the question is, that's what I'm going to try to address tonight, what accounts for this turnaround? Would Russia be any different without Putin? Because Putin comes in, things uh, turn around in, in a remarkable way. So that's the question. And I, it's not the first time I've given this lecture, but I noticed that uh, after a while I tend to get drowsy. Uh, and you know, in case I forget to tell you the answer to the question, I'll tell you now so that if you get drowsy, you can fall asleep. And, and when you go home, people say, what do you talk about? You, you'll remember this much and you'll keep it in bed and you forget the rest. You think about other things during the rest of the lecture. Um, the answer is, it's not poop. It's not Putin that accounts for the turnaround. It's due to the fact that oil prices go from $10 a barrel, as they were in 1998, to 100, as much as $147 a barrel. Uh, I tell my wife, she doesn't believe me, but I tell my wife that if I were the general secretary of the Communist Party of Russia or the president of Russia, and oil prices went from $10 a barrel to $147 a barrel, even I would like to look like a genius. <laughs> she doesn't believe me. She thinks I would screw it up. So, <laughs> even with that uh, transformation. But, but the significance of that is, and that's really what's reflected in the book, that Russia is uh, alternates with Saudi Arabia being the largest producer of petroleum in the world. Some years it's Saudi Arabia, but then the OPEC cuts back, then Russia is the largest producer. And as oil prices go from $10 a barrel to $147 a barrel, you can understand where the money uh, comes flooding in. That's why I call the book Petrostate. My wife is upset with that too. She thinks people will think it's prostate. It's not prostate. It's, 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 it's Petrostate. Um, so that's the difference. And you can see that if you look at this first table. You can see the transformation. Here is in the early 90s. The early 90s are the Yeltsin years. And you can see what's happening. The GDP is, is, is dropping. Uh, by 12, 13 percent a year. If there's a slight uptick in 1997, and then there's the collapse in 1998 that I just referred to. Putin comes in in 1999, and things turn around. Dr dramatically, they turn around. And it's been up ever since the dark line, again, being the GDP. It uh, is 6, 7, as much as 10 percent a year. But if you combine these, these uh, figures over time, uh, the economy is basically doubled from what it was before. And, and it's all on, on Putin's watch. So the general question is, what makes the difference? Well, the difference, again, is not Putin. It's, it's the white line that's adjacent to the dark line. And you see, it's almost a perfect correlation. Whenever the white line drops, GDP drops. It's not the other way around. And the white line, of course, it, is oil production. So it's oil production which turns around. Oil production begins to go up. And unless you can say Putin is responsible for that change in oil production, then you, you can't take credit for it. And the reason why oil production goes up is that, as I said, oil prices go from $10 a barrel as they are uh, in the 90s under Yeltsin, and then go up at as much as $147 a barrel. And so you can understand that why Russia is, is so much more prosperous uh, in, in this kind of thing. So what role does Putin play? Well, he does play a role. And if you go to the next uh, table, uh, what you will see, what Putin does, Putin's elected president in March uh, 2000. And he quickly begins to uh, purge the ranks and create what he calls national champions. Now, what is a national champion? Well, a national champion, uh, as, as Putin defines it, is you take uh, a company and you make it really basically serve the interests not only of the owners of the company, but of the state. Uh, if you ever read uh, discussions about imperialism, American imperialism, Western imperialism, people will say ExxonMobil, for example, really doesn't represent only the interests of the, cor of the corporate stockholders, but it, it, it serves America's interests too. You don't have to accept that, but that's the notion. That, that also you've got a leading corporation which really kind of carries the flag for, uh, the, for not only the company but the state. And Putin begins to create these 
these national champions as well. Now, it, 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 if you <coughs> read some of the things that Cook has written, uh, he talks about the need for national champions. I didn't discover this. Uh, actually, somebody in Brooklyn's institution discovered it. But it turns out that Putin's emphasis on national champions is plagiarized. Next time you see Putin, you can say, did you really steal those? You know, word for word, he just took it over from uh, uh, somebody who was at the University of Pittsburgh who, who wrote the whole idea about national champions. Putin is incorporated, but he moved on it. As president of the country, he could do that. And when he comes in in March 2000, he immediately begins to purge the ranks of the leading corporations and begins to put his own people in charge. So one of the first people he gets rid of is Victor Chernobyl. Chernobyl had been uh, the prime minister, but even earlier than that, he'd been the minister of the gas industry. And when so the gas industry is privatized in the Gazprom, as I say, the minister of the gas industry becomes Gazprom, uh, Chernobyl puts himself in that position. It's a very lucrative position. He does very well. Putin gets rid of him. He puts his own people in, a man by the name of Miller, he comes to chairman, he goes down through the ranks of what we came to call the oligarchs, uh, who were put in control, or took over control of these different uh, corporations and became these billionaires. He goes right through the ranks and he, he uh, uh, puts his own people at the, at the bottom, in the case of Kodakovsky, <coughs> was the head of Yukos, which was the oil company, which had then again, part of the ministry of the, of the petroleum industry. And as we know, uh, Kuratovsky challenged Putin, thought he was stronger than Putin. And Putin showed him, and Kuratovsky is in Siberia now, uh, not there on vacation. Uh, and he's going to be there for, for quite a while. So and, uh, this is just how Putin uh, moved in. And if you look at the next page, you can see how it affected the whole economy. Uh, it's, it, it, Soloviki in business. Solo means strength. And the way the Russians have taken that word means like the law and order types. So what you have is law and order types would be like people from the, the generals who retire from the Pentagon. If they go into uh, private business, become chairman of the board or something like that. These people from the ranks of the KGB, from the ranks of the military people that Putin considers his buddies, as a veteran of the KGB, uh, Putin has brought these people in. And you can see these different companies that they, they have affiliated, been affiliated with. Go down to Medvedev. Uh, Medvedev uh, became the chairman of Gazprom. That's the company we've been talking about. Uh, and you can see, again, all, again, all these people were serving uh, as in the government and then moved over into the private sector. Uh, and became very, uh, very wealthy this way, and also uh, had this, this, kind, this kind of control. So what Putin took these people, put them in charge of these uh, different institutions. And I say, in, in that sense, uh, the, the notion of national champions, which Putin uh, incorporated as, as indeed helped to turn the country around. Along the way, he's helped to take over these companies, push some of the private owners out. So as, as a measure of that, under Yeltsin, the, the oil industry, the petroleum industry, uh, had basically been turned over to private owners. The, minister, the Ministry of Petroleum was, was, was broken up. Its different entities were <coughs> private corporations. And by the year 2000, the state only owned 10% of the petroleum industry from 100% when it was all owned by the, by the state, by the ministry. By 2008, uh, <coughs> the state had increased its share to 50%. So the state share had gone back up from 10% to 50%, a form of renationalization, uh, as it were. And put, purges the ranks, putting his own people there, as you see uh, in this table. Rosneft, uh, Gazprom, the whole list of companies that were being privatized, now these, these people are in control. And it's not only that, he went beyond that. At the bottom of the page, I put down what I call print screens. Uh, this is a concept uh, that uh, the Chinese use. The children of the powerful are given corporate positions where they can enrich themselves as well. And so you can see the same kind of process taking place in Russia, just as it, as it is taking place in China. 
the, gov the, the first name on the list, Matvinenko, she's the governor of St. Petersburg, but her son now has a lucrative position, a senior vice president <coughs> uh, in Vinesh Torg Bank. Go down to the bottom, Patrushev, who was the former head of, until recently was the head of the uh, KGB or the, the, the FSB, the equivalent of the, of the, the FBI, his son, two sons, one is advisor to Rosneft, again, Russia's richest oil company, which used to be, uh, uh, well, which is still there as a state company, and, and the other son is, again, Manesh Torg Bank, these two government positions. So, in a sense, these people are dividing up the, the economic wealth of the country and putting it into their into their own, own pockets. Uh, that food moves very effectively in this way. Well, okay, anyway, that's interesting, and it's so, for sociological reasons, it's certainly interesting to see the change that takes place. But the strategy seems to work. And under Putin, it's not only that the country becomes richer, taking back as well prices go up, but uh, uh, Russia becomes, in terms of its macro holdings, Russia becomes the third largest holder of reserves, I said, after China uh, and Japan. Again, for mere bankruptcy, that's a pretty remarkable turnaround. In terms of the micro uh, impact, the Gosprey, uh, the value of Gosprey stock in the year 2000 goes from $9 billion to almost $300 billion. If you had invested in Gosprey stock, you would have done very well. You probably wouldn't be sitting very well here in the Caribbean somewhere uh, enjoying yourself. Uh, it's just, a, again, a complete turnaround. $300 billion, $350 billion in Putin and said that he expects and hopes that at some point the capitalized value of Gazprom will go to a trillion dollars, making it the world's uh, largest corporation by its market capitalization. Uh, and as, in terms of the public at large, well, I wouldn't say the public at large, but, uh, but in, in, uh, in 2008, uh, Russia had more billionaires, Moscow had more billionaires than New York City. Again, from a country that was basically poor. Uh, and this affects even in the United States and up what, what's going on with the energy sector. There's a company in Jacksonville, Florida called ITRA, I-T-E-R-A, which is an offshoot of Gazprom. Uh, and uh, its headquarters are in Jacksonville, even though its operating assets are, are in Russia. It has significance for Washington, D.C., because it turns out that ITRA, which is a Russian company, was uh, given a grant by the U.S. Trade and Development uh, Agency through the Congress of $800,000. In other words, our, our government gave ITRA, a Russian company, developing resources in Russia, a grant of $800,000. This was arranged by former Congressman Kurt Weldon whose district is not Jacksonville, Florida, but was in Pennsylvania. But well, why did Weldon find such a, a, a protege? Well, why was he so interested in uh, Itra? Well, Itra hired his daughter, uh, uh, Karen Weldon. Uh, and uh, she, she was helped, was given $500,000 to the salary to do this. And in exchange, I say, Weldon arranged for the US government to give it's about eight hundred thousand dollars. Rather, one the CD business. Uh, we give money for a purpose. What was the purpose? The purpose was because Weldon wanted his daughter to be hired. By, uh, <laughs> well, you're the point. I probably am, yeah, but but. but, but uh, uh, what I, I know government grants better than that. So. Well, but the purpose it was to develop uh, natural gas resources. For what? For the consumption for production. In other words, in other words, uh, this was a grant specifically to help Intra expand the production of natural gas. But Intra's business reserves are in Russia, so it was it was it was well, it was a shady deal. Well, that is no longer a congressman. When, when this was exposed in the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, he then lost the election. But it was just just for that reason. You can go back and look up. Punch in Kurt Weldon and see what, what you find, and you'll find just it was a very seedy business. Just, I'm, I'm not making this up. I mean, I wish I were. No, I know you're not. Hey, save your comments, please, for the questions. <laughs> Let the speaker speak. Okay, well, I, I, I'm happy. It's okay. It's all right. Now, th there's another congressman. That's Tom DeLay. Who, I'm sure you haven't heard of him. We all know him. Well, mm -hmm. he, he was working for NAFTASIP, which was another Russian company, and 
also helping. He was a lobbyist for, for, for them as well. Well, or, anyway, so all, you, you can understand why this, this is, for me, such, such an interesting thing. But, but I have to tell you that, that it was the next table that I found the most uh, intriguing. Uh, I had heard rumors uh, that uh, Russia was playing, and Gospel was playing an increasingly important role in Europe. Uh, but I didn't have the whole list of all the companies. So I went to the Tower Library at, at, at Harvard and went to the International Energy Agency, uh, which publishes uh, statistics on the role, how much, how much is exported, and, and to whom, and who imports. And I put these different things together, and I went back to my office, and I, when I put this table together, I said, oh my god, uh, this really it, it is very important, and it, it was that that really convinced me to, to write this book. The reason for that is the following. Um, if you're exporting petroleum, that's very important, of course, and we learned in 1973 that if there's an embargo on the sale of uh, petroleum to the United States, that's, that's very disruptive. Uh, it's going to cause gasoline lines, and it's going to cause uh, very serious economic problems, but sooner or later, we'll find other sources of petroleum because we just go to different sources. But natural gas is something else. Because if you start consuming natural gas, you're linked to the pipeline. And it's very difficult to find other sources of supply. We don't build a standby pipeline just in case of an emergency. It's too expensive. They cost several billion dollars to build a pipeline. So you get it from your supplier, and that's it. And you count on the supplier being reliable. There is liquefied natural gas, LNG, but even that's very expensive, and, and generally you don't want it in your backyard if you're going to blow up for building one in uh, Boston Harbor. And it's been very controversial because there's always a fear that, some, that somehow or other it'll blow up and it'll blow up the whole, the whole city. So it, it's it's very difficult. So you, you, you really depend on that pipeline. And when you begin to consume on that, from uh, based on that pipeline, then you really find yourself at the mercy of the supplier. So if you look at this, it's, it's uh, because of the dark lines, it doesn't come out all that clearly. But, but if you look at Germany, for example, Germany gets 42% uh, of its imports of natural gas from Russia, from Gazprom, almost 40% uh, as a percentage of total, of total consumption. And you go down that and you find that almost all the European countries are getting 30% or more. And if you go down to the bottom, the east, the central Europe, uh, or in Eastern Europe, you see it's 100% of the natural gas they import comes from Russia. This is absolutely critical. It's a strangle. But I argue in the book, and I, I, I can accept the, the notion that I'm maybe overstating it, but that the control of natural gas gives Russia a greater stranglehold over Europe than, than any, any other weapon. And forget forget uh, missiles or, or, or anything else. And the reason for that is if we're talking about uh, missiles, the Russians are limited to what they can do with the missiles because they know the United States has missiles. And if, if they use their missiles, we'll use ours and vice versa. With, with this, there's no counter to, to that. So if the Russians cut off the natural gas, there's nothing you can do. You can wave your finger and you can say you shouldn't be doing that. But that's, that's, there's no counter pressure uh, to that kind of thing. And so you can see what a stranglehold they have uh, uh, this way. So it really. Is, is just a, a, an enormously powerful weapon. Now, what are the current situation? Well, the current situation is not so good for the Russians. So they, they've been affected by the world recession. In fact, they've been affected more than we have. Uh, their stock market, the RTS as it's called, the index of all Russian stocks has gone down 80%. It's only about 40% for the United States. So that you, you know, uh, say that they're suffering more, more than we are. That, however, has wiped out about $300 billion worth of assets. $300 billion worth of assets. So all that growth that took place in, uh, in the 90s has been, uh, much of it has been, uh, been cut out. And their reserves fell from about $600 billion down uh, to $200 billion. That's dollars, convert other convertible currencies, the yen and, and other and euros. Uh, and this first quarter of this year, their GDP has dropped about 10% which is a big hit uh, uh, for them. Uh, less of concern is the fact that the number of billionaires has fallen in, in 
in Moscow from 100 to about 50, cut, cut in half. I don't mean to say they're out of the street with cubs begging uh, on the street corner, but, but still, that's, that, that's, a, that's a, a, a big drop. And Gazprom uh, stock, capitalized value of its stock, its market cap, if you will, fell from about $350 million to as low at one point as 20. It's back up again now. It's back up to uh, 155. So it's about a third of, of the value that it, that it was at one point. And Russia also now has inflation. So, but, but the, the point is that, that its, mm. its economy has recovered uh, and turned around. And my wife says again, my dear wife, the book is obsolete. <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's back up again. But I would argue that the gas, it's not <coughs> obsolete, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, but the, the intellectual reason is that the gas pipelines are still there. Oil brings in the money, as I said. The oil brought about 40% of their budget. That's no longer as important. Gas doesn't bring much. If you look at the last table, uh, you can see uh, the, the dark line is the revenue that comes in uh, from oil, and, and the white line is from gas. You can see gas doesn't bring in much in the way of revenue, but but you can see it's the oil that brings in in the revenue. But it's the gas that's critically strategically. It's critical strategically because you cut off that gas pipeline again. That's why I go back to the first page of the book. You you really freeze. You don't. You, you just don't have uh, any, any alternative. So gas brings in only maybe 5 6% of the revenue, but it's strategically uh, much more important. And it, it gives them leverage. It gives them leverage into joint stock companies. It gives them leverage into becoming part owners of a large number of European companies simply because the Russians say, if you want the natural gas, you have to let us inside operating pipelines within uh, uh, Europe uh, it, itself. Uh, now, with the recession, like I say, the Russians have been hurting, so it's, again, causing a problem for them. Their banks are closing. Uh, they've had runs on their banks. Uh, it's a very serious kind of concern. Factories are closing. If you have the Internet, if you have access to the Internet, uh, there's a, a very, uh, from our point, from my point of view, using, but from the Russian point of view, a very serious concern called Piccolobo. Piccolovo is a factory that was owned by some of the oligarchs. It's located between Moscow and St. Petersburg. Uh, and the workers went out on strike. They closed it down. It was uh, an unfair metals factory. It was owned by one of the oligarchs. It was broken up. They closed it down. And the workers protested. Uh, again, kind of an unusual phenomenon. And they protested by blockading the highway. They sat down on the highway. Blocked traffic between Moscow and St. Petersburg. And then they went into the factory and sat down in the factory. Uh, I, and when I was a kid, I remember sit-down strikes uh, in the United States. And, and, and what they were worried about is that this would spread throughout the whole country as they were closing these factories that, that I was just describing. So uh, the, you can see this scene from Piccolobo in, in, in the factory. And Putin comes there because it's that much concern. He goes to this factory, and he gets the oligarch who owns it, a man by the name of Deripaska, to come and sit there as well. And in this, you see it on, on YouTube, uh, Putin orders him to sign a paper, which is in front of him, ordering the factory to be open again. And, and Putin throws a pen at him, a fountain pen at him, and says, sign this paper and get him back to work. And Putin has these very steely eyes. Uh, you know, it's, he stares at him in a way that you, uh, I've seen Putin uh, several times now. <laughs> you don't want to be, he stares at you. You know, it, it, it's a very strong personality. And, and so you see this. And, and anyway, these minstrels then have taken this and they put it to a song saying, got troubles in Piccolobo, what do we do? We call Putin, Putin, Putin. You know, basically, he's our man. He can't do it. No one can. I mean, it's, it's, it's that kind of notion. Of course, it's in Russian. You don't have to understand the Russian, but you get you, you can sense uh, what's going on. And, and he's there. And there are other uh, cities where there have been strikes as well. Uh, again, an unusual phenomenon. And Novosibirsk, in of a stock, again, 
as the country goes through these economic difficulties, the workers are, are protesting. And the trouble for the Russians is that they don't, they're not used to this. It's not to say that we look forward to recessions in this country, but because we've had enough of them over the years, beginning in the 1930s, we've adopted measures which we hope will alleviate the impact and indeed help restore the, the economy as quickly as possible. For example, what we call them, the economists call them automatic stabilizers. Uh, is unemployment increases, we can get to dip into uh, unemployment compensation, and we spend more money. It causes a budget deficit, but this gets people back to work. In a time of surplus, a bit of prosperity, we increase the taxes and put the money in the side just for that rainy day thing. The Russians don't have anything like that. They don't have, they've only just recently introduced uh, insurance for bank deposits. So what happens if you hear in Russia that your bank is under difficulty, everybody runs and you have a run on the bank, and of course that means the banks collapse and this kind of spreads. They've only just introduced federal deposit insurance. Why don't we ru rush to the bank when we hear that it's uh, in difficulty? Because right now the U.S. government has arranged for, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation provides up to $250,000 insurance per deposit, and there aren't many of us who have more than that in the bank. So those people have more in the bank than rush, but the rest of us can rest assured that uh, we're going to be okay. The rush is have only introduced this for the first time and only covered twelve thousand dollars worth of deposits. So it's it's something that's that's uh, quite uh, upsetting for them. Well, anyway, uh, who's going to get the blame now for these problems in Russia? And that, for me, is is the interesting question. Um, uh, Putin is, is there. Putin comes in. I say things get uh, go up. Now, if you look, go back to that first that first page. This is Putin. Is, everything is going well. But now look at 2008, you can see that oil production goes down. And if you look at 2009, uh, the GDP is falling. And what happened in 2009? Not yet, point in this question. So Putin believes things fall apart. And so the question is who's going to get the blame? And, and my feeling is that it's going to be not yet. There are a variety of reasons for that. Putin is very strong, you know, you see without his shirt. Uh, very forceful personalities. I said, Medvedev is not. Medvedev was his protege. Medvedev uh, was in Gazprom, uh, and, and Putin has brought him along. And Medvedev is now the president. Putin had to step aside because of term limits, and is the prime minister. But Medvedev is there. But Medvedev doesn't inspire the confidence. My <coughs> wife gets upset when I say this, but he's short. Uh, and not that Putin's tall, but he's shorter than Putin. And, and he's not muscle bound. In fact, you know, he, 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 we've met with him now twice, and you have the feeling he's standing on his tiptoes to make up for his lack of height. And he tends to wear shirts that have these big collars. And you, have, you look at him, and I always have the feeling he's been poured into this, this suit. And what I, I think of it is unfair. But, I mean, the Russian people are, I think, are responding in somewhat the same way. I think of the Mad Hatter, you know, uh, uh, he's got these big collars and, and he's kind of really not fit for, for the thing. And, and, I, and I think that the other is going to suffer as a consequence uh, uh, of this. I, I do give them the other credit. The last time we were just there in, in September, and they've got to met with us. Uh, Lunch. And then he went outside. This was, we met, we didn't meet in the Kremlin, and we met across the street from the Kremlin and boom, the department store. And you know, the, the Red Square, and then across Red Square is the, is the Kremlin. But so Medvedev yeah, met with us, and I, I didn't think in a very forceful way. But then he went outside, and the crowd had gathered. Either they saw his car or they saw him, and he went in and he shook hands, which I thought was a very, people were waiting, they wanted to shake his hands. He went into the crowd, I thought that was a very nice. Justin, then he got in his Cadillac and, and, and drove away. Uh, interesting to see that some people still like Cadillacs uh, <laughs> in this environment too. But anyway, there he is. Now, was he going to last eight years? He's only been in there for it'll be a four-year term. Will he be reelected? I don't know. Uh, we'll continue to give the call for Putin to come back. But Putin is still cocky, and I, I give him credit for that. And he blames the United States for his problems. Um, we probably share some way, but he doesn't. But Putin really should look up to Russia itself and to the 
role of oil prices. But Putin still has this sense of absurd. And let me just read uh, again, if this is in the book, but it's, it's uh, this feeling of, of that he can, that he's really very much in control. This is at a press conference that took place in 2007, but Putin's attitude hasn't changed at all. Uh, he's asked by a German reporter about former federal, uh, about what the federal chancellor Gerhard Schroeder, who called Putin a pure Democrat. So the reporter says, Schroeder called you a pure Democrat. I should say something about Schroeder, by the way. Schroeder was a chancellor of Germany, then he went to work for Gazprom. Uh, building pipeline, and basically mm -hmm. he did a lot to make sure that Gazprom did very well. Uh, and as in my mind, short is not much different than a prostitute. I mean, he really just sold himself uh, for this, and now he's getting a salary of about eight hundred thousand dollars a year from Gazprom. Anyway, so that's that's beside the point. So so Putin's response to that correspondence question: Am I a pure Democrat? Putin laughs. Of course I am, absolutely. But you know what the problem is? It's not even a problem, but a real tragedy. The problem is that I'm all alone. Uh, the only one of my kind in the whole wide world. Just look what's happening in North America. It's simply awful. This is all true. Torture, homeless people in Guantanamo, people detained without trial and investigation. All true. Just look at what's happening in Europe. Harsh treatment of demonstrators, rubber bullets, and tear gas used first in one capital, then in another. Demonstrators killed in the street. All true. But then he ends. There's no one to talk to since Mahatma Gandhi died. Well, <laughs> I mean, there is a sense of absurd, but you know, the dominance of your charge, you do that. Right, that's, so if you've got questions, I would be happy to try yes. I, uh, I met you once because my late wife was at Wellesley, and your, your wife works on China. Right. My hope is that the next book you write will be a comparison of China and Russia, uh, you know, the transition from communism to, to capitalism. Well, you've actually written an article in Foreign Affairs doing exactly that. Okay. But, but that was an experience I was very surprised. All right. Uh, <laughs> the question I have for you, I've written on this, but so I'll share it with you. Uh, I've been concerned. That my, my question is this. Both China and, and Russia have severe problems with corruption, but it's far more dysfunctional in Russia than in China. What is your explanation for that? Uh, that's a good question. I think it's right to the heart of the matter. Uh, the Chinese are just historically used to that. Uh, the Russians you know, in the Soviet period were much stricter. The Chinese, in the Mao era, was the point thing, but, but it carried on a level. The Russians opposed that, and when the Soviet system broke down, the communist system broke down, and oligarchs took over, it just really, fun enterprise, and this really brought it along to, to a great head. And, you know, to some extent, you've got to take control of the New York corruption because it's made oil the parts, and so somehow it's come in, in, in the Russian system. And uh, the police work became corrupt. Uh, uh, the party no longer served. The party, to some extent, uh, in, in, in Russia, the party was simply there was really no force. Religion was not a factor. It was there, uh, you know, ethics and, and the various ways. It, there are no good answers, but there are you know, a variety of, of possibilities. But it is a fascinating uh, comparison to make, and not easily uh, explained. My question is about Russian support for Iran. Uh, Kasparov ex explains it as uh, on the ground of tension, the Middle East drives up oil prices. That's good for Russia. But that seems awfully short sighted, taking the, the long term consequence of the nuclear Iran for Russia, which is very polite and has problems with Muslim parts of it. What is your sense? Yeah, it's a hard question to answer, too. Uh, the, you, we talked about this this last meeting, that the series of meetings we had with the Russians. Um, they, as you say, it, it's really the Soviet Union, but the border is common. I mean, Russia, some of the other countries, some of the countries are really horrendous. Oh, well, you share the KC. Uh, the, the Russians have a uh, lot of support for them. They, I think, uh, fear it, but no idea how to respond to it at this point. There have been signals that Nebyashik indicated that he would like by the army to uh, defend them to be more than I or so it's right because of the war. But of course it's a worry about it. If you're manning up, you're not going to will certainly be involved among your coming your father. So it's, it, it's complex. The Russian happy of the Iranian are bothered to us. It's not as not much as it was in the old days in the, in the uh, Soviet era during the Cold War, but uh, uh, it, it's a problem. I, th there are, you know, what are we doing to try to work 
be a, in conjunction with the Russians. Well, to some extent, uh, there have been efforts to unite together to share. We share intelligence about the Islamic fundamentalism. That uh, goes into Iran as well to the extent that the Iranian the Iranian government is encouraging that financing uh, some of the different groups. So that has been uh, uh, one common area where the Russians and, and the Americans have worked together. Uh, we don't talk, our government doesn't talk much about it, but I've heard from, from people in Moscow and the embassy of Moscow that we do work with, with, the, with the Russians <coughs> to try to, at least to share intelligence about what's happening. Um, certainly, I think there's room for much more uh, cooperation. But uh, it, it, it's a bother. The, I should tell you, the Russians have had, well, they haven't had uh, 11, but, uh, you know, they, uh, they have had their problems with Islamic fundamentalism in, in, in ways that are, are more frightening. Now, if you go through a Russian airport, that uh, you know, makes ours look easy uh, in terms of the security. And they've had explosions in the cities, and. Uh, there are checkpoints on the highway. You go through, you, you go along the highway. There are checkpoints were there before, uh, partly to check on contraband and illegal things, but they're also checking just to make sure that terrorists are, are not on the move. So uh, this is an area, again, I say, where there is, where we do work together, and, and I think in, in constructive ways. How, how do you see uh, the Ukrainian Russian oil? So, and also, if you're thinking about the Russians in Crimea wanting to make some uh, an independent in Crimea. Yeah. Uh, Russia and Ukraine are, you know, historic. It's not nothing new. It's uh, there's a lot to. Uh, and uh, for Gazprom's purposes, of course, uh, initially all the pipelines went through Ukraine, uh, and the Russians wanted Ukraine to pay more. They were getting, and the Ukrainians said no, and so. That's where we got into this business of cutting off the gas. Uh, the, it's a you know, there are ethnic, it's ethnic reasons as well as economic reasons. There are other tensions. Um, I, I think Putin has tried to at least not make them worse, but but that doesn't mean he's made them better. Uh, where does it go? Uh, there's the Ukrainians are talking about uh, the Crimea, which is. You know, quite sensitive for, for the Russians. I don't think we in the United States appreciate uh, as much as we might uh, what Russia's gone through in the last few years. I'm not, I'm not pleading their case, but I'm saying, uh, uh, imagine you were a Russian and you had this big empire and suddenly you discovered this, this this the empire has, is half of what it was before in terms of land. So the, the Russians feel humiliated, and, and uh, you know, what, where did it all go? It's not just Ukraine, of course, it was also Belarus and, and the uh, you know, Caucasus and Central Asia. They're all gone, and they're all independent. I mean, it would be like in the United States if, say, we lost not just Alaska and Hawaii, but we lost New England. People would say that would be better for the rest of the country. <laughs> but, uh, uh, um, you know, it would. Where did we go? We were a great power, and now we're not such a great power anymore. So it it, it affects their thinking uh, in subtle ways. Um, but and, and, and to the extent that the Ukrainians say, well, we're going to uh, try to develop a more independent border, that's just another slap at them, and it's a, it's going to be a source of tension. The Russians don't have much choice at this point because uh, they they are trying to bypass Ukraine in terms of their gas pipelines. But it's, it's very difficult to do. Uh, they're trying to build the South Street, would bypass Ukraine and the North Street, that would bypass Belarus, uh, which has also given them uh, problems. But uh, uh, so far, they it hasn't come to open fighting. But there, you know, there's just there is a lot of tension <coughs> between 